Good morning, everyone. I think we're ready to begin. Before I introduce our speakers uh, this morning, I want to warmly thank people who are and have made today possible. Events like this one do not happen easily. Uh, it takes a great deal of working together, and I would say that there's been a lot of that. Dr. Jenny Douglas and all of the people at the WVU Teaching and Learning Commons have welcomed the library's ILSEP poster uh, showcase and program into the proceedings and into the new way of doing Faculty Academy. Kathy Klingerman and the staff here at Mountain Lair have absolutely been fantastic and on behalf of the Dean's yeah. Office at the libraries, I thank them too. Mentioning the Dean's Office, I want to go on and say that my co-workers in the library's Dean's Office have been supporting me all throughout the preparations for today's, today's events. And led by Cassie Kaplan, they are people with great dedication and capability, so I want to thank them publicly also. And I also want to mention that our Associate Dean, Myra Lowe, and our new Dean, John Cawthorn, who we met just a minute ago, are behind me and this program 100%, so I'm deeply grateful. I want to welcome all of you here in person, uh, but I also want to mention that this session is being streamed live, so welcome to anyone in the West Virginia, Western Pennsylvania network of librarians um, who may be with us this morning. I have passed out the relevant information for connection and feedback information, should you be interested in using that, it's on a sheet that looks just like this, and they're around on the tables, so please pick one up if you're interested. Uh, Jennifer Snipes of the DCL Research Services Department has um, kindly volunteered to monitor and report the tweets that come in for this event, so thank you, Jennifer. And now, um, by the way, I'm Carol Wilkinson. Uh, from the Dean's Office at the University Libraries. I'm Director of Instruction and Information Literacy. And I'm now honored to introduce our speakers for this presentation this morning. I am very happy that they agreed to come and be part of the Celebrate event this uh, year. Both have made sustained and distinguished contributions to students, to faculty, to librarians, and other educators over several decades as information literacy education has evolved into a core priority for higher ed education. Craig comes to us today from Ohio State University Libraries and Trudy from the University of Albany Libraries. Trudy has a new book out, which we are shamelessly promoting. Uh, there are bookmarks around for the book. It is entitled Meta Literacy. She has written it with her colleague Thomas Mackey and among other accomplishments, Craig has written the most comprehensive and accessible history of information literacy uh, that I've ever read, and he's also the most effective and thoughtful book editor that I have ever worked with. Most recently, these two talented individuals have teamed up to lead the ACRL Information Literacy Competency Standards for Higher Education Task Force. That is a huge committee name. Uh, in the development of a new framework for information literacy for the future, which is what we will hear about in just a few moments. There, I, I must turn the mic over to them, but I want to share with you that in recognition of uh, his extraordinary contribution to our field, Craig won the Association of College and University Libraries Miriam Dudley Instruction Librarian Award in 2008, and the very next year, in 2009, Trudy won it. This is given to an individual who has made an especially significant contribution to the advancement of instruction in a college or research library environment. This includes, for example, planning and implementation of an academic instruction program, production of a body of research and publication that has demonstrable impact on the concepts and methods of teaching and information seeking strategies, and sustained participation in organizations at the regional or national level devoted to the promotion and enhancement of academic instruction in the library environment. Trust me when I tell you, both of them have done all of these things and more. 
This morning, they will talk to us about update on a paradigm shift, the new framework for information literacy for higher, higher education. So please join me in welcoming Trudy Jacobson and Craig Gibson. Thank you, Carol, for that very um, gracious introduction. And uh, we're very glad to be here with you today to give you this update and perhaps also to get some ideas from all of you about how this framework might be most useful to academic librarians and their colleagues. So um, here are our names. We've already been introduced. Um, and here's the hashtag that's already been mentioned uh, here. Um, what we're going to do here today is talk a little bit about student research behaviors. We're going to talk about the goals for this framework that has already been mentioned. We're going to talk about threshold concepts, which are the underpinning of uh, the framework. We're going to talk about the other major elements of the framework and the implications for the framework. So. I'd like to do something a little bit active right here at the beginning. I'd like each one of you to write something. I'd like you to describe students' research skills, the students that you know and deal with in one sentence. If you could describe how your students do research, or what their challenges are, what their problems are, if you could just write that down really quickly and as concisely as you can. Sometimes I know it's hard to do concise. <laughs> just capture that very quickly if you can. Okay, would one or two brave souls like to volunteer what they think their, uh, their students' research skills are like? Yes? Primarily relies on internet. Google Primarily Google relies Google. on internet. Okay, how many other people agree with that? <laughs> okay. Uh, somebody else want to give us a, what's another characteristic of students today that's a little bit different from that? Uh, students see the information world as flat. They see it as flat. Could you elaborate on that a little um, bit? I think going back to the using the internet, since they access most of the information online, everything is equivalent. Yes, yeah, the, the web, you know, we've seen this for a while. It, the, the effect of the digital environment, it just flattens everything out and they don't differentiate or they don't understand nuances or distinctions. Maybe one more example. Yes? I put down one word start. One word? Okay, so it's one, they use one word? Yeah, they use one word or one little phrase. To search with. And so therefore they get the most popular. Yep. So uh, a lack of nuance, a lack of sophistication, and yet they're very technologically proficient in many ways. We know that as well. So uh, I wanted to go over briefly uh, some findings from uh, a series of research studies I think some of the librarians in the group are probably going to know about these from Project Information Literacy. Uh, there have been a number of these uh, that have been held uh, over the last about eight years, and uh, Allison Head has been leading this project, 
and she has she she uh, presented a paper last year at the uh, ACRL conference where she summarized the findings from some of the research studies that have been done of students' information seeking behavior. And so some of these things would probably confirm what you already know, uh, that students are really just, they're overwhelmed and they're uncertain about where to start. They don't know how to formulate a good research question. Uh, they don't understand academic assignments or the way that their faculty are, the, the, the assignments they're being given, they're, they don't know how to, convert the assignment itself into a way that they can actually map that into the, the information resources that are out there. And they're often confused about when to stop, you know, when do they have enough information. Uh, the open-endedness of the whole process confuses them. And of course we know that they have their favorite places they go. And of course some of us go to our favorite places as well, but they go to Google, they go to Wikipedia, and they have a few academic library-sponsored databases that they return to repeatedly, but they don't often expand their set of resources or they don't develop more sophisticated strategies. Uh, and that's often driven by the types of assignments that they're given. The, the standard academic library research paper is, is such a time-honored genre that we don't often, you know, we're not creating different types of assignments that would develop other kinds of research skills. And so they're often perpetuating what they've learned in high school, their high school habits. They carry these on into higher ed, and then it, it, it really is interesting thinking about when they get out in the world of work <laughs> where they're facing even more challenges. You know, If they're still perpetuating those same habits once they get into the workplace, uh, what that, the implications of that, just carrying this forward, this lack of sophistication. So, uh, I think to summarize that, uh, the single most important missing element is they don't understand context. And by, there, there are several different ways in which they could understand context, uh, one of which is they need to have background or summary information even to begin to ask a good question. They don't often have that to begin with. Uh, they don't understand the process of information gathering. They don't understand the language or specialized terminology that might help them be more sophisticated searchers and evaluators of information. And again, the situation or the context for the assignment or the project itself may uh, create difficulties for them and they don't understand how to shape that or, or understand the parameters around that particular uh, assignment. So these are what we mean by context and the project information literacy findings really do highlight the importance of context. As students are often just searching in a context-free mode. <laughs> Every kind of thing they do on the internet is equivalent. In other words, they, they, they're, not they're not surrounding their research question or they're not looking at sources from a particular disciplinary perspective. They, are, they don't know how to situate what they're doing in the appropriate context. So, uh, what our task force uh, started thinking about uh, when we first started meeting is, is to think about a new way of framing information literacy. We've been talking about information literacy for a lot of years in this profession, and sometimes we keep reverting to you know, fairly prescriptive and tried and true ways, and we just know that the information world, the landscape itself, is so dynamic and so fluid and has changed so much that we need to give students the bigger picture. We need to have them focus on the information landscape. We need them to develop an, a more holistic way of understanding how all this stuff works together and perhaps to understand more than just procedural or skills-based Approaches, but to understand why they do what they do, to understand the why, to, to help them get beyond or to transcend those particular skills and resources. And I think even more important to have them understand that there are real human beings who are behind these processes of creating information and publishing information. <laughs> and uh, they need to know what ends up on the library shelves or on the library website it doesn't just mysteriously appear there, that there are actual groups of people, there are experts, there are communities of discourse, that all of this is part of this notion of the ecosystem that they need to understand, and there's a, hu a whole human 
dimension here that they often don't get. So we settled on thinking about a framework rather than standards. And so some overarching goals for the framework uh, was to create flexibility to for our librarians and the faculty that they work with to think of a flexible system of learning information literacy concepts and also to, to focus more on students as creators and contributors themselves to uh, this information world rather than just cons passive consumers. And also, I think Trudy will be talking some more about this the importance of monitoring their own thinking. This is ever more important when students are turned loose in this very dynamic, fluid environment. They're working with the idea of metacognition and the ability to self-correct, to monitor one's thinking and to improve and get better over time. And also to know that learning really does involve the affective or the feeling domain. It's not purely a matter of thinking or the intellectual aspect, but the motivational or the affective domain as well. So, threshold concepts, threshold concepts. We decided early on to use these as the underpinning <coughs> for the framework. And if you've read a little bit already about them, you know that they originated not in the United States, but in the UK with the work of two economists, uh, Meyer and Land. And there have been a, a small group of librarians in this country whose names are given here, uh, who've adapted them or taken that idea of threshold concepts for our work, for our practice in information literacy. So what are threshold concepts? I think the best way of explaining these, if I could give you a really, really concise definition, uh, they're the gateway or portal concepts that are absolutely foundational in any field or discipline. So it's if students have to pass through a passage or a portal and then they begin to understand everything else in that field in a broader way or in a more integrated way. So uh, there are some characteristics of these and I've given five, the five of them that are often referred to here. If, if students understand something foundational in their discipline, it transforms how they view the discipline or how they think of themselves at, in that discipline or how they learn. It, a threshold concepts enable them to pull together uh, smaller concepts or skills. Once they get the concept, it's really irreversible. They don't go back to an earlier level of understanding. They, it's really not possible to do that. Uh, these, these concepts are often bounded in that they, they set, they're set apart from other concepts in related fields. And they're often really troublesome. Students struggle with them. And they have to, you know, sometimes there's an aha moment and they really get it. And sometimes uh, they don't get it and they have to live with it a while. <laughs> and they finally get there uh, with the appropriate struggle and with mentoring and coaching and helping. So um, uh, just an example of a, of a threshold concept, say, in a field like uh, geology, I would say a threshold concept in that field would be the concept of geologic time that is immense, <laughs> it's enormous, and it's very hard to understand that. We know, I'm not a geologist, but I know that that's very, very difficult to understand, understand that idea, and once that's grasped, it may, a lot of other ideas in that field begin to make sense. So, what I'd like for you to do quickly is pair off with uh, somebody sitting next to you and identify a, a threshold concept in your discipline and share that, what you think it might be, given just what we've briefly gone through here. By the way, I didn't ask for a, hand, a show of hands earlier. How many of you are faculty, and how many are like faculty first? And then how many are librarians? We've got a good mix of people here. So uh, whoever you're sitting next to, if you could just do a quick think, pair, share on what you think a threshold concept in your field is.
I think we've got some really, if you could give me your attention again, we've got some really good conversations going on here. But this is what always happens. <laughs> I'm really glad to see everybody interacting. Hello. <laughs> uh, I know there's some really good conversations going on. I'd like to hear just from a few of you about what you decided a threshold concept in your field is, both from faculty and from librarians. So a faculty member, tell us your discipline and tell us what you think a, a threshold concept would be for, for your field. Yes. Um, I'm in theater. Yes. Um, and I was talking to Beth here about um, the differentiation of presentational versus representational. Okay. Theater. Okay. And it applies to all the disciplines of theater design, acting, criticism. So everything. is it something students struggle with? Oh yeah. All the yeah. time. Yeah. <laughs> There's that fourth wall and you, you, dealing with the audience is, is a big issue. So so what have you done in the past to help guide them through well, this? Uh, I guess, you know, we read dramatic literature that applies right. more to one side than the other so they can see See both the application sides. of it yes. uh, in, in performance or in, in the drama. Okay, very interesting. Another faculty member from a, from a discipline, uh, want to volunteer? Yes. Uh, David Beach from English. Yes. Sure. And I, th I think one of the threshold concepts that we have in composition and rhetoric is students finding their own voice in their writing instead of Yes. So instead of the students being wanting to fill in a blank, having them claim their own language and present their work in their instead own way. Instead of regurgitating <laughs> what they read. Yep. A librarian, anybody from the library want to volunteer what they think of, they've noticed that students struggle with? Yes. Um that the research process is iterative. Right. It's not just done. It's sort of like what you were saying earlier. It's they have students to, want the answer, they want they to be want finished. They want the answer, and it's not, usually isn't that way. Right, <laughs> and I'm, real a, research. I'm a science librarian, so that's particularly true for us. We, are all, we always have questions. There's always questions we're working on. Questions have to be refined. Any, anybody, any other, any, the librarians and the, and, the, and the audience want to volunteer one more. Yes. So I, I'm from physics, and uh, we have a tendency to write very neat problems for our students. Yes. But when I ask them to apply it to the real world to figure out the physics themselves, they struggle a lot. Yeah, so the ability to solve real structure problems, you know, that's definitely a, a, a challenge and a skill, and students don't often understand that mm -hmm. right at the beginning. So I hope. Now, what we begin to see is some of the, some of what you've been thinking about here today uh, fits some of the characteristics of threshold concepts. There's a major international movement now to discuss these, you know, and to think about these, and to redesign curricula around these. So, 
the whole impetus behind what we did as a task force was to think about these and to incorporate uh, for our information literacy. And here are some of them that our task force has identified. And I think some of you, particularly in the, among the librarians, have read the framework, the draft framework that we put out already. And there are six of these right now. We've been revising them and revisiting them as recently as last week. So scholarship is a conversation. <laughs> well, I think we probably know that, but students don't understand that. Those of us who've been in academia for a while understand that, but students don't get it. And once they get that, they begin to see how pieces of scholarship fit together or influence each other. Research in is inquiry, format is a process, information is an ecosystem, is a new one that's been suggested. Authority is constructed and contextual and information has value. I won't go through each one of these one by one. There's a, the draft again is up there and you can read these, but these are big ideas that we think are foundational and that would help organize student conceptual understanding in a much better way than a set of skills reflected in standards. So Trudy will be talking with you now about um, other parts of the framework. Thank you, Craig. And um, I would also like to add my thanks to um, everybody here and to Carol and to John and the organizers. Um, um, this is just a wonderful event. Thank you. Um, and just while this slide is still up, just to mention, information is an ecosystem. For those who have been following um, the work that we've been putting up on ACRL site, um, that is replacing searching as strategic. Okay. So um, the major elements of the framework, and as Craig mentioned, that because we are still working in our task force and we had an in-person meeting for a day and a half in Chicago last week, there are some changes to those who um, have seen things on the website. So, um, so we're thinking about the packaging of this framework and we've decided to start it off with a one-page sort of guide for using the framework. Um, and so this will get people into it sort of right away um, and um, will replace in a way the current introduction. Um, some of that material is going to move into this guide and then the introduction will move sort of later in the package. Um, there will also be introductions for faculty members and administrators since maybe looking at it slightly differently. Uh, there will be a revised definition of information literacy um, Craig started one that's in the current introduction. Um, from those who might have seen the change between the first um, set of threshold concepts that went up on the web and the second, we've taken meta-literacy sort of out, the meta-literacy learning objectives, and this sort of goes in with that sort of shameless plug um, for that book information. Um, but we're going to be redoing that definition to incorporate some of these um, ideas and just have it as a part of information literacy. Um, the threshold concept units are going to be called frames and I'll be talking about what will be in those frames but because um, we've been sort of talking about six threshold concepts they are value added there are additional pieces of material in them um, so there was a lot of sort of head scratching over what to call these until somebody suggested frames it's like oh yeah why didn't we think of that before <laughs> um, a glossary which is already up a bibliography and um, something that's been a little bit debated an online space for continuing discussion many of us think this is a wonderful idea um, but there's the concern on the part of the Association of College and Research Libraries that this might um, be neglected. People might think it's a great idea, but not actually contribute to it. So um, we're here making a plea that um, we would love to see ideas, things you're doing, the types of things that were in the poster sessions um, that fit in with this would be just great. So, um, and with that online space, these disciplinary examples, some sample scenarios we had talked about putting into the framework that we're going to actually put into the online 
space. Okay. So each of these frames, Craig went over the six threshold concepts. So a frame will consist of the thres threshold concept with a description of it, the knowledge practices or abilities that students would be able to do in connection with it, and we're being very careful, we do not want to call these skills because they're often more than that. The dispositions, so what is it that an individual might um, sort of be inclined to do that will help with this particular frame? And then um, we're probably going to call these assignments. They're going to include what was before called assignments slash assessments and also the self-assessments will go into this category. Um, this will originally appear online with the, the framework, but eventually will go into this online space. The concern is that they might date the document, and by having them in a separate space, um, that might help with that issue. However, we've heard from a lot of people that the suggestions that we've been putting in have been helpful. They truly are <coughs> just suggestions. So uh, let me actually go through one. Um, so that you can see. So Craig mentioned authority is contextual and constructed. This is just the very beginning of the brief description, and then there's a somewhat longer description of this particular threshold concept. Um, but this is something that we all understand, that the authority really depends upon where this information has come from, the need of the person who is using the information, um, and then so the context for both. Okay. But again, something that students just may not be thinking about. Okay. And so here are two uh, of the knowledge practices. Um, one is that disciplines have acknowledged authorities um, that are widely considered standard. However, even within the field, there may be some disagreement about that. So it's not the sort of monolithic idea of authority. And then also that authorities could be um, packaging their information in different ways. So it may show up as a scholarly journal article. However, it could also be a blog that a scholar is using to uh, perhaps translate this information for other audiences. So um, understanding the nuances. And then the dispositions. And um, so an example here is that they're motivated, motivated to find authoritative sources, but understanding this manifestation of authority um, may be more nuanced. Okay. So one of the questions about this is, well, how do I work with these dispositions? And you know, I think that's something that we need to talk about. However, um, in the courses that I teach, I often just share this information with my students to sort of have it be um, something that they can reflect upon. And here is an example of what we'll probably be calling an, just an assignment. Um, and I'll let you read this. This is one of the um, frames that we put up most recently and one of the things that we were being asked for was some guidance um, for how to use these. We were rather conflicted about that because we are only making suggestions here. We're not telling people how to use these. It really depends upon your situation, your discipline. Um, however, um, we decided we'll put some in and see what the feedback was on it. So here, you know, how you might want to use it. You might want to use it for, you know, lower level courses. Um, if you only have one hour or one class period, this might be something that could be adapted for that. Um, and it overlaps with another threshold concept. And we've gotten very good feedback about providing this kind of information. Again, we don't want to be prescriptive, though. We really want people to be discussing this and thinking about what will work. So the implications of the framework, I'll do this and then the timeline, and then we will open this up for questions. So, um, 
So one of the things is we really do want to increase collaboration between librarians and course instructors. For those librarians who are in the room, thinking back to the standards, the information literacy standards from uh, 2000, um, if you were to hand those to the faculty member you might be working with, um, do you think the reception would be extremely welcoming? We worried about that. They're very long. There's a lot of detail in there. And so what we wanted to do was to have something that might be um, speak better to both groups. Um, we're really, this is very different. We're not actually looking at the level of learning outcomes, performance indicators. We really are, here is something that you can work with, you being librarians and faculty members, um, so that you can identify what it is that your students need to learn to be successful in what you're teaching them. Okay? Um, there's more focus on formative assessment and identifying gaps. Um, and these are things often that we just understand. Um, the threshold concepts that Craig mentioned make sense to us. Um, but by thinking about it more explicitly, um, these gaps might become more obvious. Um, there's the potential to use students as partners in action research and curriculum revision um, or coordinating curriculum within departments um, for those who are teaching information literacy courses within the courses. Um, so there could be some continuum here. Okay. So the next steps. We are working very hard at finishing up a complete first draft so that new um, guidelines for using the framework, um, the introductions for the faculty and administrators are pretty much done, um, but putting all of the pieces together, getting the last of the frames finished, and we will be releasing that draft for public comment sometime in mid-June. Okay. Um, also, Somewhere in June, maybe a little bit later, ACRL is making a commitment to this, and they are going to be hiring a half-time person for a 12 to 18 month period who will be working on um, that online sandbox, who will be coordinating educational efforts, um, webinars, pre-conferences, that type of thing, and doing outreach. Okay. There will be a hearing at the annual meeting in Las Vegas, there will be online, an online hearing, probably one, um, online hearing so that if you're not able to make the one in Las Vegas, you know, we welcome participation by everybody. Um, any additional revisions that need to be made will be made this summer. It then needs to be reviewed by two ACRL committees and this fall will be voted on by the ACRL board. So there's still a number of steps. We've been in close communication with the ACRL board and there is strong support for this, um, but we need to make sort of all these changes. So at this point, we welcome questions uh, from the room, from the Twitter feed. Um, if there's anything that we can ex explain further? Yes. I might have missed it, but the slide said six frames, yes. and there were four points. Am I missing two frames? OK, so let me go back. Oh, these, this one here. Yes, there are six frames. Let me get the frame. These are the actual frames. Ah, okay. So they have four components okay, within thanks. them. Sorry about that. Yeah, good point. Yes. Yeah. Uh, just finishing high school aspect and going back to their old standbys. Um, what are ways that we can help at our end in the K through 12 aspect to allow for them to come in better prepared and have a better understanding at the same time? Is there, should we be working on a framework at the K through 12 level too or are we just focusing really on the higher education aspect? And we've had some discussion about that because uh, AASL has their own set of standards, of course, which we reviewed. 
and uh, we've actually taken over the dispositional, you know, they're in, in, the, in those standards, the ASL standards, they're, they're pretty inclusive about including dispositions. So we actually got that idea from them. I think that's an area that's wide open <laughs> for bridging between K through 12 and higher ed and thinking about uh, curricula and working, I, I know some people have mentioned the common core standards and you know, we're, we're aware of all of those issues and I think of working with um, the, the AS, AASL probably would be a really good idea for ACRL to think about ways of preparing students with different types of assignments that challenge them to get beyond the tried and true or to think about different ways of, of doing research rather than just going to their standard Wikipedia. There, it, it's an area that's wide open. <laughs> I don't have any quick and easy answers for you at this point, but I'm a, I think it is something that we could definitely work on. AASL, American Association of School, School Librarians. Librarians. Yeah. A librarian who was unable to make it today uh, emailed me two questions and I'd like to bring those up on her behalf. Um, the first was a question about the first threshold concept. She wanted to know more about social media that contribute to academic knowledge and more of the background thinking there. So could we do that one first and then I'll go to the second one. So. Um, was she talking about scholarship as a conversation, do you know, Carol? Yes, I think she was, because she okay. mentioned the first threshold concept. Okay. Um, so um, we all know that students are using social media a great deal and, and therefore have, uh, they are creators of information as well as consumers of information, and we've been very cognizant of this. Um, and so I'm not quite sure. We've gotten questions on this topic from a variety of different viewpoints, and I'm not sure um, where this question may be coming from. Um, we did have um, a comment saying that we should just not even consider social media, um, and that is something that we think is um, unrealistic and really and needs to be involved. Um, we understand that students are not contributing to these conversations in the same ways that experts may be doing so, and, and we're sort of writing the uh, definitions for each threshold concept to acknowledge that, but they may be in the future doing that. They may be going on to graduate school, and, and, um, and so we really want them to start to think of themselves as sort of responsible um, individuals within this, and that brings on a whole new set of sort of responsibilities. So I don't know, Craig, did you want to add to that? Well, it's just even the awareness that you know, scholarship can include different forms that are non-traditional. I mean, just having students understand that alone, I think <laughs> whether or not they're contributing to it <laughs> directly, just you know, knowing that scholars in a field may be publishing blogs or, or do publish blogs you know i think that or other mm -hmm. use social media in different ways that in itself just the, the awareness of that yeah a couple of years ago i taught a new course that was um, essentially um, sort of using social media for research and, and we were having our students look at blogs and tweets and that type of thing and to use that for the information resource um, a website that they were creating and the pushback on that really was pretty amazing. You know, no, we can't do that. No, that's not the right kind of information. No, you know, because they've been hearing this. And so it's not necessarily a realistic situation. Thank you. And then the second one is um, about the fourth concept. She encountered, as she read it, the concept of the invisible college. And this was not something that she was familiar with. So she just wondered if you could explain that. And so the fourth one she's talking about. And they uh, may be in a different order, too. Yeah, um, I think she. The website. Well, <coughs> I'm not sure where she was looking. This, this is the basic message that she sent. But 
But the uh, isn't the Invisible College an, an early yes. um, historical it's an, we, that's notion? That's been around for quite a while. You know, the fact that scholars, researchers communicate with each other, you know, at early stages and, you know, in ongoing ways, you know, that, that are, may not result in publication, but that's how ideas originate. And it feels so. Thank you. I'm sure that will do the job. Is there anything else that either we didn't explain clearly or um, because we've been living with this so long <laughs> that uh, I think that, you know, um, we may be making assumptions to. Yes, um, looking at this, um, these threshold concepts, I must say they are powerful. And I want to commend all of those who, for many hours, for many days, weeks, months, wrestled with this. This is not easy work. Um, one of the slides indicated that this was going to go out to the public at some point in the summer. Do we define public as the public that is uh, librarians? Are we including the great unwashed like me uh, in the definition of public. I, I think um, we would like feedback from everybody who feels and has an interest in this. And that would actually be extremely helpful. Um, now, I don't know if there, there was a form up on the website before. And I'm not sure if we're going to have something like that again, or if, um, if it would just be through the online hearing. But I would say that you know anybody in this room, please feel free to send comments to Craig or to me. And the we can website. pass them. What is the it's, the a it's the ACRL, um, the Association of College and Research Libraries, has a website. And it um, provides the drafts of this. So there's a link to, or will be yeah. a link to and, this room. Would there be a way, Carol, to get? I'm yes. not sure if we had it on our initial slide. Let me just look. No. Oh, it is. It is there. Oh, right. so, so that's the one. Yes, that's okay. the one. And our contact information is there, too. Uh, Any more questions? I'll, yes, I, I want, I'm wondering about the. Yeah. Well, we've, oh, we've, we've, dealt, we've been getting that question a lot, and the mechanics still had to be taught. We just thought that this framework probably is a sounder way. You, you still have to teach those skills, but we do not want to prescribe how to teach those skills. We think you can do that in your own situation. You know best how to do that in your own environment. And so to try to prescribe that or enumerate, you know, the skills that need to be taught. I mean, the current standards do some of that, and we wanted to move away from that approach. But we think the more powerful learning comes from getting the conceptual underpinnings in place. Now, we've been talking about conceptual learning and, and information literacy for a long time. This is not new. Uh, I can point to articles that were published back in the early 1980s about conceptual frameworks. <laughs> but we think that this is a sounder footing now. And given the, how much the environment has changed, we think that uh, threshold concepts, along with the other elements that we've <coughs> talked about, are a better way, future-oriented way, longer term, more staying power with these than just teaching skills. But you, you do have to teach those. It's just that you, you will, we're counting on everybody to figure out how to do those in their own situation. And, and they really sort of build into each of the frames. So for, you know, um, research as inquiry, I could see doing some of the things I tend to do anyway, but it's towards this goal, you know, to have students sort of cross that threshold. So I'm sort of thinking about it in a different way. Um, I'm monitoring the Twitter feed, and we have a question from a Megan Oakley, who's... Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yep. 
who's wanting to know how the framework's going to fit in with the AAC and U value rubric for information literacy and what your thoughts are. Yeah, there's been some uh, early conversations already between ACRL and AACU, and I think that's going to be a priority because AACU, you know, they, they've definitely made information literacy a priority. Mm -hmm. And this question is also coming up about a lot of the discipline specific associations that have adapted the, the standards. So I think that's the next phase. Okay. <laughs> Our group probably won't be addressing that, but we're very much aware of it as an issue, given how much time has been invested in the AACU value rubric. Okay, and just since I was just translating this, can you tell me what the AACU is? I don't recognize it. American American Association of Colleges and Universities. Okay, see, and I should recognize they, it. Uh, I have identified some very large learning goals, and one of them is informational literacy. Okay. And so this was a major, a really major accomplishment for them to do that, and we want to acknowledge that. But it will probably require some re thinking or reworking over time. So this is part of this transition that we're looking out to in the next year or two with this framework, influencing documents that have already been created or maybe recasting of some of those. Okay, all right, thank you. I'm just curious, and uh, has there, is, there any, is there any interest in, or are you planning to do any kind of crosswalk from the old standards into the new framework, or you don't even want to go there. It's, they're too really different. Go there. yeah. It's impossible yeah. to. We yeah. thought to about pull that, together. but we think that trying to find correspondences, Just, there are yeah. some, but to try to do that in a very precise way, I don't think it's really beneficial. Yeah. <laughs> what we do want, we will be having some visualizations, and one of them that um, some of our task force members are working on is um, intersections between the different threshold concepts and perhaps nodes on linkages, but we haven't seen it yet. So, um, and then we have some others that are coming from meta literacy that will be adapted to information literacy. So the information literate learner and sort of, um, so, there will be some that we're doing, but the one you're asked about, I think we've decided against. We're going to end the webcast now because we have another one starting, but please keep the conversation going. Thank you. Thank you.